I'm Dr. Wanji Konganga from the University of Nairobi, from the Faculty of Science and Technology, specifically from the Department of Computing and Informatics. I do my research and uh, academic work in the field of language technologies and artificial intelligence with a deep emphasis on African languages. So I'm privileged to be making this presentation this, uh, today on digital resources for learning indigenous languages. So looking at the nexus between technology and how we can leverage technologies to support the, lang the learning of indigenous languages. So in my discussion today, we'll just uh, maybe ask what in our understanding is language learning, just to put the context in terms of what should technology do to support those goals of language learning, then look at the best practice in terms of language learning, and uh, especially in indigenous language learning, and ask where does technology come in, and what are the prerequisites, the best practice that we should deploy when leveraging technology for language learning. So when we talk about language learning, really the ultimate goal is to give somebody the ability to use language, okay? So speaking, comprehension, and responding in an appropriate way. That if I speak to you, you should be able to understand what I'm saying and respond. So it means that you're able to use language, whether it is reading or writing or uh, comprehension, uh, spoken language or written language. So what is the best practice in terms of language learning? So of course, the first thing we're told is that there must be an early exposure to a rich language environment so that uh, there's success in the acquisition of language. So this means that for somebody to learn language, they have to be immersed in an environment where they're hearing this language in use. Okay? Extensive listening and reading practice enables competent speaking in real life. There's the issue of language drills, that you have to hear the same thing repeated over and over again so that you start to understand how this language is formed, what are the structures, where do the words begin and end. So the whole idea of uh, drilling and uh, repeated uh, tasks help somebody to learn an, a new language. So when we talk about best practice for even indigenous language learning, we have to think about these things. How are we going to surround the learner with a rich environment where they hear and use this language? Okay? And uh, there's the whole idea of we must learn how to split between reading and writing, separate from speaking and listening. So even as we employ technology, we need to follow the best practice. It's not just a matter of creating a technology which has no grounding in theory of language learning, so that we're sure that even the tools that we're creating are actually effective. So as we go on, I will be explaining more about how do we ensure we have best practice uh, as we develop uh, language technologies to support uh, acquisition and learning of indigenous languages. So the other thing we need to ask ourselves, what are the guiding principles that uh, should really be in any platform or system that is being developed to teach uh, somebody how to learn uh, or to learn a new language. Number one, when you even think about children, they learn what they hear most, right? So you have to hear and hear and hear, and that is what is learned. So we must ensure that whatever tool, whether it is digital or not, that we're immersing this user or the learner in a space where they're hearing the language in use then children learn words for things and events that interest them. So you can't separate learning language from the day-to-day -day life of the learner, right? It's like taking a child who's somewhere in Kambu and all you're talking to them is about space. That is going to be so far removed from them. But when you start with what the child is interested in doing, maybe they're trying to make a rubber doll or a tire and you start working with them from that position, then they will want and they will be motivated to learn because they want to do the things that, they want to learn about events and things that are around them. Then there's the notion of interactive and responsive, that uh, there has to be interaction. It can't just be passive, right? So we don't want passive contexts. Those ones inhibit learning of language. So even as we think about the best ways to deploy technology, we have to ensure that the technologies or the platforms we are building are actually interactive and they're promoting responsiveness from the child or the learner. Fourthly, uh, children learn words best in meaningful contexts, right? So you can't just remove them, as I said earlier. It has to be in a context that 
<laughs> the child is familiar with and it is part of their life. So that becomes interesting and relevant and motivates them to learn. Then lastly, we also have to acknowledge that vocabulary and grammatical development are reciprocal processes. What do I mean by that? That you can't just assume that you're going to teach somebody the vocabulary and the grammar and that they will acquire the, the knowledge. So we have to expose them to different uh, contexts where they're learning different forms of the language in terms of the verbs, the syntax, the semantics, and at the same time, they will be picking up the vocabulary. So I'm putting this as a context because when we talk about digital resources, people are quick to just think of video games or you know very simplistic tools, but my emphasis should be that it's, we have to approach it from a very uh, informed, uh, way. So we first have to ask what promotes language learning in general and how do we then move these techniques and methodologies and theories into a digital environment. So the biggest challenge we're facing currently, especially for most of the indigenous languages in Kenya, is what we call an impoverished home environment. So the language input is not at the level that it should be, whether it's at home or at school. Of course this differs when you talk about urban areas, it might be that children are speaking Kiswahili, they're speaking English, but they will not hear a lot of the indigenous language being spoken around them. In contrast, maybe if you go then to the rural areas where there's a, a bit more of the indigenous language being spoken, then the notion of these other languages, the English and so on, there's not enough language input. So the point is that whichever language, whether it is indigenous or not, there has to be a rich environment where the child is hearing and using this language at home. Then there are the challenges that of lack of readily available, high quality, engaging content, be it in analog form or digital form. Right, we're talking storybooks that are engaging, colorful, with interesting stories. We're also talking about if I go online, can I find a cartoon series that's speaking in my language and that is engaging and interesting for me. So we have a big gap there that we do not have readily available high quality that has been designed with the principles of language learning pedagogy in mind. Then there is limited availability of what we call learning technologies, sorry, language technologies. Because when we talk about um, leveraging technology, then we start to ask what are these technologies we're asking about, what is needed, and I'll be explaining uh, as we go forth. What are these uh, technologies that we say are limited and we have to put an emphasis on ensuring these are being created if you're going to uh, develop or, de or leverage technologies for indigenous language uh, learning. Then the other aspect is limited availability of native indigenous language speakers who have the knowledge of <laughs> the modern methodologies of teaching language. It is one thing to have your mother or your grandfather next to you. They can talk and talk and talk. But we need, if we're really going to scale and have an impact like what is happening in the classroom, we're seeing that uh, indigenous language teaching is part of the curriculum, right? So the teachers in the classroom, do they have the requisite skills to teach indigenous languages? Over and above just being a native speaker, there is that we need to go a bit more so that they understand what is the best way to ensure a child is learning. So I want to now quickly talk about the digital technologies for indigenous language learning. What can we do with technology? We've talked about the principles, we talked about what needs to be in place in terms of uh, the principles, the standards, the best practice, and the challenges that we're trying to overcome in this context that we have of indigenous language learning. So number one, there is a very big opportunity, what we call multimedia courseware, right? That we have technologies that we're talking about videos, that are in indigenous language. We have games, so computer games that can engage the learner in doing different activities because we said we need something that is interactive. We want to avoid passive uh, technologies that the child is just there watching a cartoon, but there's nothing that they're doing. In fact, it, studies have shown that when children are passively watching, they may not pick up as much language as opposed to when they're actually being interactive and they're being given chances to be responsive to what is happening in the video, in the game. Then we have animations that can be created just to specifically explore certain concepts. We've talked about being contextually relevant. So it could be something maybe around the culture of that particular community or an event that has happened in the community. And we have animations where that whole scenario is described and the child or the learner can now pick up the core vocabulary and learn how to express themselves about that particular event. 
We have what are called flashcards. This one may be very familiar with because we also have paper flashcards. So it is very easy now to make digitized flashcards which can be randomly changed using like AI. So you can generate hundreds and hundreds of flashcards without having a human input, right? So it means that we're able to do much, much more without requiring an intense uh, army of human teachers, but use what we call the teacher AI tutors to do this work for us. So you can actually have AI generated flashcards. Then there are things like crossword puzzles. There's so many things that we can leverage that we've done in the, in the analog or in using paper based formats and now use them, recreate them with technology, but of course adhering to the best practice of um, generating these tools. So I've talked about AI and I want to really emphasize, I'm sure all of us have heard about ChatGPT. We've seen the capabilities it has even just for complex texts, right? So you can imagine for a language where we have developed that level of capability where uh, a software can understand and generate language, the opportunities to create amazing technologies to support learning are limitless. So we can use AI to expand the content and the scope. I've given an example of the flashcards and there are so many other examples. Like uh, when we're talking about, we said we want to enable drilling as well as immersion of the learner with minimal effort. So imagine if you're in a classroom right now, you go to a school somewhere in rural Kenya, or even in the urban area, you have a classes of 50 to 60 students, um, very little immersion and personal attention will happen for that learner by the teacher because there are many kids and the teacher's time is limited in the classroom. But if we now leverage technology, it is possible to have what we call asynchronous um, learning, self-paced learning, that each child will have access to the content. They can focus on what is interesting for them as long as it has been developed with the pedagogies of language learning in place to ensure that the child is being guided along the journey of acquiring this uh, language. Then we have the notion of speech training using uh, speech recognition and speech synthesis because there's a big emphasis actually on the spoken word that the first thing is we need to hear and speak and understand before we can go to the written word. So this is also a very niche place where technologies can come in that if we have um, speech recognizers and there are many tools that are using uh, AI for maybe French or Chinese where the child listens to something and they're asked a question and they speak back and the AI actually recognizes that speech and generates the text and marks and says, yeah, the child has actually spoken the right thing. So instead of, you, we're able not to automate that process of teaching just by leveraging the technologies that are available for us. There's the notion of uh, assignments because uh, we've talked about um, immersion and drilling. How do you drill in language learning? You have to give very many examples of the same concept over and over and over again. If you're using non-digital technologies, that is limited by the resource of the teacher and the time available. But you can imagine with just an algorithm, you can generate every two seconds, you can have a different structure of the same sentence, just reconfigured differently to keep testing and challenging the learner. So it's possible to do auto-marking also that when the student makes a response as they're learning the, the language, the system can correct them and give them feedback, you know, so that we're able to constantly work with the child um, on a real-time basis. Then we have what we call web and mobile-based language apps for drilling and immersion. And we may have heard of tools such as Duolingo, there's Babel. These have got millions of subscribers around the world. Of course, these are focusing on the Indo-European languages. So we have the French, the Chinese, the Japanese, we have Spanish, German, Portuguese. And the, the market share of these tools are growing every day. So that tells us there's actually a business case there. And it has shown that it is effective that people are not only learning how to read and acquire grammar, but even oral competency is rising from using these apps. So it is already a tested use case that that is something that also we could do for our ind indigenous languages. So the other way we can leverage technology is to promote um, language learning in a social context. So the same way people meet at home or in the marketplace or at church and they're talking, we can simulate the same environment using technology. So using uh, conferencing tools, we are so now familiar with them that you can actually have a virtual class where people come together to converse. And uh, the beauty about this is that we need to expose the language learner to the different intonations, different accents, different people speak differently. 
so that the more they hear the variety of the same words, then they learn to recognize them in different contexts or in different spaces. So it's not enough to just say that you can do a, a, a synchronous learning on your own in some corner, but it's good to come out and interact with other speakers so that you're hearing and you're responding and you're acting. So that also really boosts confidence and uh, makes it a much more social and fun activity. So what are the critical success factors to ensure that uh, we're not just throwing technology at a problem, but we're actually providing a solution using technology? Yeah. So the first thing that we must do what is called uh, planning of the solution. So if you're coming up with digital content, it has to be age appropriate in terms of the design and the content. So for example, if you're teaching a three-year-old, yeah, you will not start talking about rules or words, you'll just have a lot of animations and pictures. But the same approach might not work for a 17-year-old, they might easily get bored. So we must have age-appropriate uh, design and content, getting to the same means but using different channels that ensure that the different types of learners that we have are motivated. Then something else that is very important is what we call localizable learning resources. Right now we are facing, we think about the indigenous languages in Kenya, there are very, very many, and most of them suffer the same fate in terms of lack of resources. So as we develop technologies, it is important that we learn to think about how they can be localized for different languages, so what we call bootstrapping, that I can create a shell of a software that does something for Gekoyo, but that can very easily be repurposed for Kikamba or for the next language, so that we're not requiring everybody to always start from scratch. Others will never, never make it. Okay? So we have to have something that is localizable, so that we're able to create contextually relevant content that what might be um, working in teaching maybe the Ma language, the vocabulary is going to be totally different from a fishing community, right? But the technology need not be different, yeah? But if we create in a way that I can actually replace the lexicon, I can replace the images, I can replace the activities just with a command, then I can repurpose the same platform to serve many different languages. So what we call you build once and you deploy several variants. I think that is a technique that we really should push forward as we talk about uh, creating digital resources for indigenous languages. Then another critical um, approach is that we have to incorporate content and activities that boost the four language skills. We're talking about reading, writing, speaking, and uh, hearing, of course. So. It's not enough to just have something that's boosting only one skill, right? That might be a wasted effort. And for us to do this, then we'll be able to see that you can't just have just a group of animators sitting there and creating something good. There must be a whole team that plans what needs to happen from an instructor, somebody with knowledge about pedagogy, then you have all these other uh, uh, competencies that are needed. So for example, you could have a module or a lesson that could be designed to first start maybe with a cartoon series that's uh, giving us a context. Maybe it's somebody who has to collect some fruits and sell them, you know, just a nice storyline. And then with that, you follow it with a phonetic study of the high frequency keywords that occur in that series. Okay, so the child is, it's something engaging, but then you extract something for uh, phonetics that they can hear and recognize some of the, the high frequency keywords. Then from there you follow it with a speaking exercise so that the child would be asked your character X, what would you be doing? And they have to say something, you know, that is related to that context. And then from there you can have now pictures that are extracted from this uh, cartoon series and the child is required to, cor to spell the words correctly or identify the words or the hear what I'm supposed to spell it and then from there speech training and assessment using speech recognition. So we're saying it's not just enough to say I have a video or I have a cartoon or I have some clickable flashcards. We need to really go back and ask the effort we are putting into creating these resources is that giving a round, an all-round uh, challenge in terms of 
what the learner must learn to do as they go through that particular content. So the idea of ensuring that we are attacking the four skills that are needed as much as often with most of the content that we are creating. So, so far, we've tried to look through their few attempts of uh, existing uh, technologies that are supporting ind indigenous language learning. There is a site called uh, the Siri Online Campus where they teach uh, different indigenous languages in Kenya. And uh, so far, they've got a few animations on Gekoyo. So you'll have a girl who's having an activity and she'll say, my name is so-and-so in Kikuyu and I'm going to do this. Maybe say my dress is this color, you know, so there have been very minimal attempts. And uh, I think it's high time we support the people in this space so that we generate a lot of this um, content so that even as a teacher is in the classroom, there's a lot of supplemental materials and resources that they can leverage when the child is in school as well as when they go home. So it's easy to say, let's do this, let's do that. But when you talk about technology and language, there's what we call foundational language technologies. There's some things that must be in place before we can build the end user technologies. So you've heard me saying that we could use uh, speech uh, AI to listen to what the child is saying and transcribe that and check whether they actually pronounce the things correctly. But that doesn't happen uh, in a vacuum there are underlying technologies that make that possible. So I want to go through the key uh, language technologies that must be in place if we are to then build uh, language resources for indigenous language uh, learning. Number one, there's the whole idea of the orthography, right? We know that some languages are fairly well resourced. So you take, for instance, Kiswahili, but there may be others where, in fact, the research is ongoing to actually collect the words and ensure that we have a standard orthography. We have documented all the sounds and we have the IPA uh, characters for them. And that's critical because if we don't even have the description of this language in a written form, then, at what, then it becomes impossible to start writing programs to understand that language, computer programs that is. Then the other related thing is fonts. We are very lucky that most actually most of our Af uh, Kenyan languages just use the standard Roman uh, script. But you may find like in other languages, like we've done some research on the Igbo language and when they study the dialects of Igbo, there were so many characters that had never, or rather so many sounds that had never been recorded and captured by the standard Igbo orthography. So the first step was actually to document them, to do research around them to identify their IPA equivalents, and then after that to draw, <laughs> come up with a calligraphy for those uh, uh, sounds and ensure that there's a font you can type on the keyboard. Okay, so there's that whole area of the characters and uh, ensuring that they exist. So of course, I think for most Kenyan languages, I would imagine all of them can be written with the current uh, Roman alphabet. Then the next la layer is from when you come from the alphabet, we come now to the words. So we come to the dictionaries and the lexicons. If you're talking about incorporating a spell checker to check whether the child has written, spelled a cor the picture correctly, there must be a spell checker in the background, a spell checker for this language. That is based on a lexicon, it's based on a machine readable dictionary. Are we compiling this tool so that somebody who's having now to build these language resources can leverage on these uh, foundational technologies. Then lastly, and uh, not uh, the most important, is computational grammars. Everything that we see AI doing, even when you look about, uh, at ChatGPT and Google Translate, at the back of all that are rules about the language. We know what is, permiss what is permissible, what is correct, what is correct syntax, what is incorrect syntax, and all that comes through grammar, right? So we may have these grammars for Kiswahili, even maybe for Yekoyo, Kikamba, they exist, but they're not yet put into what we call computational grammars, that a computer algorithm can actually now use that as its knowledge base to be able to make sentences. I talked about the, need, the, the power of technology to help us in immersion, where if I'm giving, um, maybe we're learning a certain, the phrase of sentences in a particular language, maybe in Kikamba, Right, you know, there's a noun, there's a verb, there is a preposition and all that. It is so much easier if there's an, a computational grammar in the background for an algorithm to actually just mix and match, randomly create very many test sentences that can be used to train. Okay, so without these foundational technologies, we'll be limited. We'll just be having very simplistic 
um, applications. So it is important that we put in a lot of emphasis on developing the foundational technologies so that we're able to support text and speech processing, what we call uh, automatic speech recognition, and also to help uh, in the immersion of the child in terms of the language use and language examples using AI, which of course is going to ride on the computational grammars that I've talked about. So the digital challenges that we have to address, even as we build these foundational technologies, as I've said, there's the orthography for languages which may not be written, and maybe in the Kenyan context, it might be the dialects that we focus largely on the main language, but with respect to the dialects, perhaps there's still more work to be done on that front. The input of these languages via keyboard, the issues of tone, especially for Bantu languages, that's a critical area that has not yet been cracked even computationally, which is important if we're talking about automated and digital tools. Then of course the grammars and machine readable dictionaries. So it's not all gloom and doom, at least we know what needs to be done in terms of uh, what challenges or the action points we need to take. So when we talk about the lack of foundational technologies, then the solution here is multidisciplinary uh, collaboration among research teams. You're coming, you're bringing together linguists, you're bringing together language learning experts, and you're bringing together computer scientists who put together these technologies in a way that makes it easier for other uh, third party developers to create very interesting apps. Of course, all that requires funding, so there is importance that we have funding to support such uh, foundational research to build these tools and then human capacity development. Ultimately, we need the people, either the universities or research institutes or wherever people are dealing with language matters, that we are building the, the skills to not only develop the foundational technologies, but also the end user technologies for the language learning that needs to happen. Then uh, when we talk about language learning tools, I have said it's not just about creating a nice video and or a nice animation. We have really good animators but there has to be the science of language learning driving the animation that is being put in place so to ensure that the four skills are being incorporated into that design. So here we need people with expert in uh, language, pedag language learning pedagogy, instructional design methodologies, animation, graphics, software development, machine learning for personalization. And lastly, and very, very critically, is what I call the business model and monetization. None of these apps will take off if in fact the people who are putting in the effort and the resources do not have a viable or sustainable business model. So it's important to have support. Um, and you see when this, the tools I've talked about like Duolingo or Babel, they have over, there's one that has about 50 million subscribers. So for a couple of dollars maybe every month, people are learning and learning very many languages and the, there's now funding to continue improving those tools. I pray that one day we will be at that level where we have this kind of tools and business model to support such innovative products that will help us uh, not only preserve our languages, but continue to have the next generation acquire and use these languages so they do not die off. So we need incentives to attract the private sector to participate in this space and uh, people who can come up with viable business models that we can adopt to help us in uh, leveraging technologies for indigenous language learning. Because when we talk about indigenous languages, they may not always be associated with commercial value. So very, unless there's a direct deliberate effort to ensure these resources are being put aside and the technologies are being developed, you can't just wait for the market forces to ensure that it happens. I think there has to be legislation or policies or just real affirmative action in this space to ensure that these things are happening. So in conclusion, the, the relevance and the importance of digital technologies for in, uh, indigenous language learning are very, very important. We cannot uh, emphasize enough that it is actually the way to go. Technology will solve for us two problems. One, in the terms of uh, preservation of these languages that are at risk of dying off. And then secondly, we are able to create, to use, the, to use technology to implement learning language technologies that adhere to the principles and standards that I've talked about. The danger we have of uh, not relying on technology is that as the older speakers die out in our communities, we are left with children or people who do not know these languages, but they have no one to teach them. If we create platforms and AI tutors that can do the job for us, 
they will not there's no risk of them dying off all we need to do is keep updating the software you know and we'll have this for posterity so it is important that we actually uh, do these things then it allows us to scale to different learners in different contexts I don't have to be in my physical classroom to learn. I can log on from the US when we were my diaspora in Kenya and learn a Gekoyo, join a Gekoyo class. So there's a lot that we can do to uh, address the limitations that physical spaces are giving us. But if we lever leverage technologies, we do away with our physical boundaries, even age boundaries, competence level boundaries, because <clears throat> the technology can do what is called personalization. It will adapt to your level of knowledge and work with you uh, in terms of from where you are and to where you're supposed to gain the competency of that new language. It's also not enough to just say that there's the technology and it's going to work. Learner discipline is critical for success. We might develop all these platforms and tools, but if there's no discipline to continuously use them, maybe two or three hours a week, you know, then you still will not acquire. So there has to be a support system or incentive system that, that uh, attracts, so the technology stuff must be user-friendly and attractive, that people want to use it, but also there should be a way to ensure that the children are actually using these tools in their effective way so they can actually uh, pick up the skills. Then uh, blended approaches work best. You cannot just have technology on its own, as I've said. You can have self-paced asynchronous learning coupled with synchronous face-to-face -face or virtual conversational activities. So that we can have, um, the technology really come in handy when we are talking about explicit language learning, so the grammar, the vocabulary, the repetition. But when you come to conversational activities, as much as you can use AI for speech recognition and speech processing, it is important to also have a virtual community of speakers. You know, and we'll still leverage the same technology to give us that blended approach. So we can have the face-to-face -face instructional time being uh, reserved for communication-oriented activities and the self-paced uh, synchronized uh, tools being used for the hardcore grammar, vocabulary, rules and all that uh, in terms of training. So lastly is to say that we need concerted efforts to be able to produce technologies that will have an impact in this space of uh, language learning. We have the people with different skill sets there's a technology that needs to be developed and there's a business model to make it all come uh, to pass. So I hope I have uh, communicated how we can use technology, highlighted what are the challenges that technology can solve and also emphasize that technology is not the one-stop solution that we still have to mix what we're calling blended approaches where we do some stuff with the technology and other activities to, so that we continue to teach language in the way that it is used as a living language. Thank you very much.